Okay, welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Nikolai Miklin from University of Düsseldorf. Nikolai uh, did his master thesis in uh, in Moscow. Then he uh, he was doing he did PhD with Alfred Guna uh, in Siegen, and then he spent uh, I think almost like three years or around three years in Poland in the University yeah. of Gdansk when he was a postdoc of uh, Marcin Pawlowski. And yeah, now he is, as we heard before, uh, working with Martin Klisch. Uh, Nikola is a like expert on various topics in quantum information uh, and foundations, so entanglement, non-locality, compatibility, uh, self-testing also, uh, as well as uh, some, well, he did recently some work on causal structures, and this is what, like, this is a topic that he's going to talk about today. So uh, th thanks, Nikolai, for agreeing to come. The, the screen is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation and for kind introduction. Yeah, so I will be talking today about the work that I did um, in while I was at the University of Gdansk and it's work, joint collaboration with uh, Mari from Köln and Rafael from Natal from Brazil. Um, yeah, so this work is about quantifying causal influences in quantum causal scenarios, and in particular in the scenarios where we have something like what I call quantum common cause, but I'll explain everything, I'll try to explain everything in more detail. So the central idea of causal reasoning appears when we uh, look at some correlated variables, A and B, and we try to give it some explanation to those correlations. Um, and these ideas date back to Reichenbach and maybe even earlier, but he was the first to somehow formalize this idea that if you have C uh, correlations between two variables, A and B, or two events, then there must be one of the three explanations to that. Um, either A has a direct causal influence on B, or the other way around, B has direct causal influence on A, or if there is no direct causal influence, that there must exist some hidden, maybe hidden variable or some hidden causes um, that create the correlations between A and B. So this one of these three different situations uh, must occur. And um, there, of course, there are more complicated in general scenarios in which A can also have a direct causal influence on B, and there also can exist some common hidden causes uh, that create the influences, the, the correlations between A and B. And maybe in these uh, uh, more uh, difficult scenarios, it's, it's uh, meaningful to ask more qualitative questions, not just the question of what is the causal explanation of the correlations between A and B, but what is the strength of each of the causal links. So I didn't say it in the previous slide, I can say it here. Um, this causal, when we reason about causal influences between observed variables and sometimes hidden variables, we draw direct links uh, which uh, in the direction of the causal influence. And what it usually, you can think about it as a functional dependence between uh, probabilities or the rule how you should write the uh, observed correlations via Bayesian rule, for example or more generally, it's called a market condition. Um, okay, so in back to this particular scenario, in this kind of mixed scenario where you can have a direct causal link between A and B and also a hidden common cause lambda, you might ask a question, uh, how much of this causal dependence between A and B is due to the co direct causal link from A to B? And how much it is could be due to a hidden cause lambda? And in order to ask the, answer these questions, there was a very powerful tool that was introduced by Perl, and it's called um, intervention. And what people do in the intervention, they fix, basically they just fix the, some value of A, they set it to a particular small A value here, which I write here. So they, yeah, they, they fix one of the values and they see the, how the marginal distributions of B changes according to that. And one can even have measures uh, of these causal influences and one of them, which I will be 
focusing in this talk is average causal effect. And it's expressed in terms of these new probabilities. Uh, for now, I will explain on the next slide what I mean by these new probabilities. But um, before that, I'll also say a few things about the notation. Okay, Michal, you want to ask a question or no? Well, I, I just wonder why is it called average while, while you have maximization? Uh, uh, good point. <laughs> I, I unfortunately don't know. Um, maybe there is some worst case scenario that you can consider and then there'll be a different de definition. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, sorry. I yeah. think at, at the moment, just a name. Take, take it yeah. as a, yeah, take it as a name. Uh, yes, so I, I'll just quickly say about the notation to such that you can unscrabble all the, all the probabilities that I'll be writing. And then uh, by capital letters, I'll be noting uh, random variables and the corresponding um, small letters, the values of this random variable. And then this is the common shorthand notation that I'll be using just to such that the, all the formulas don't look super, uh, super big. Okay, so what is the due probability? If let's say we have um, such a, again, direct cause, uh, a cyclic graph with a causal structure, we say that the observed correlations between A and B have to be written in this particular form, where we have a distribution, first of all, this red distribution of lambda, and then we have uh, response functions P uh, for the values of A given lambda and for B, which now can depend on lambda and on A. And now if we take these response functions and we simply remove the part corresponding to A, then this would be the due probability of uh, B conditioned on particular value of A here. So it's important that when we write this due probability the these response functions are exactly the same as those in the observed correlations. But physically, or like an experiment, you can really think about uh, replacing A by some definite value and looking at just looking at the um, marginal distribution of B. Um, but this instrumental, uh, so these um, interventions, they were a very, this is a very powerful tool, but sometimes it's not possible to perform an intervention or sometimes it's, it's not uh, due to different reasons. For example, one can wonder about the strength of causal influences in past experiments where you cannot anymore perform the intervention or sometimes it's immoral. For example, like in this case where A could be uh, the variable that determines whether a certain person is smoking or not, and B, whether they develop some disease like a cancer. And then there was always this uh, standard question that people uh, hear from time to time is whether smoking actually causes cancer and to which extent. And this is exactly this uh, scenario in which lambda can be also some other reasons that you might not observe, like gen genetics and so on. And they, of course, in this case, it's not um, ethical to force some people to smoke if they don't want to. So we cannot perform an intervention in this case. And what people devised is to introduce an additional uh, variable like um, here called X, it's an instrumental variable that is believed to have a causal dependence only on A, but not on B. And then by uh, var varying this instrumental variable X, we could still determine potentially hope to determine the strength of the causal link between A and B. Um, coming back to this example, X can be, for example, a taxation of tobacco, which shouldn't affect either genetics or development of cancer, but definitely causes some people to smoke or not. Um, and I'll just to give a, somehow an example of how um, one can use this instrumental variable to determine the strength of the causal links. Um, let's assume that the variable B has a linear dependence on A in this simple form, in the linear form, where kappa here is a linear term. This is, is a one by which A is multiplied. So it determines the strength of the, of the causal link between A and B. And in this case, we can uh, calculate covariances between X and B and X and A, which can, we can measure in experiment. And then the, their ratio would be exactly this kappa. So by simply measuring the covariances, we can determine the causal 
strength of the causal link from A to B. Um, but okay, in this particular case, we assume this model, this linear model, but in, in general, of course, it doesn't have to be the case. Uh, but it's still possible, it is still possible to use this instrumental scenario to determine the strength of the causal links. And in particular, in this paper of 1997, uh, Bauke and Pearl proposed um, a lower bound for the average causal effect from A to B that uh, is just a linear expression in terms of observed correlations. So just by looking at the statistics of uh, here, this is the conditional probability of A and B conditioned on X. These are just observed statistics. One can lower bound the average causal effect from A to B or the strength of, of this causal link. And for that, one doesn't have to perform any intervention. And I just remind you that this ACE here is, is this expression in terms of the two probabilities. And this um, bound can be sometimes tight. So this value on the right hand side can be even one. So you would know that all the dependence between A and B came from the direct uh, causal, causal link. Um, maybe a short uh, um, note on this letter C here. C stands for classical, not quantum. And that's the reason because I will now be talking about the quantum common causes. And first of all, we need to say what we mean by a quantum causal model and what can we how can we interpret such a graph in the quantum case? So if in the classical case, we were just writing the, our uh, distributions uh, in terms of this market condition by just response functions here, it's a bit more complicated by this uh, arrows. We will always be meaning uh, thinking about them as, as um, channels. And partic in particular, if this channel goes from the quantum system to the classical system, it's, it's a POVM. And uh, this link from raw to A is a POVM for um, A side, and then for B is the also a, it's some POVM. And then raw, if it, it's something like a coherent common cause, and it has two um, distinct arrows, we say that it, it is a bipartite state, a bipartite system that has, uh, yeah, that lives on two Hilbert spaces. And the observed correlations in this case is just this um, board rule. And it's, uh, this, this framework was introduced in this paper of 2015. And now if we come back to the instrumental scenario, we also need to say, need to say what we mean by this link now from X to A. And in general, there should be some um, channel like classical quantum channel that takes both X and row AB to an observed variable A. But for simplicity, it also can be expressed just as a collection of POVMs where X denotes the choice of a POVM. And now the link from A to B is exactly the same, but you can choose your POVM for B according to the value of A. Okay, is there a question? No. <laughs> Um, yes, and the observed correlation in this instrumental scenario in the quantum one is expressed in terms of this uh, also born rule, but you have what is important is that this outcome A here that determines the effect of the POVM is the same as the, this A here that determines the setting for B. Okay, um, and now I need to say what is the due probability also in the quantum case. Um, so similarly, uh, we- um, sorry, sorry, Nicole, can I, yeah, can, sorry. Can mm -hmm. I, sorry, I was a bit slow with this, but can, can I ask, so so, uh, like here you, like there is a strong distinction between quantum and, and classical variables and like, uh, how, like, is it possible to, to yeah, to have some how like scenarios when A and B would be also quantum and X, uh, like, because like, how how to how should I phrase it? Like, so so you uh, so here is all sort of based on just some measurements performed in a quantum state and just maybe like future so to say measurements depend on outcomes of like measurements that Bob performed. 
can depend on results that Alice got, uh, right? Yes. Yes. Mm. Right. So. Yeah. So yes, a bit more generally, you should always think about these links, those channels, mm -hmm. and then it just you need to look whether the node, the node that you, the the end node is quantum or classical. And if it's classical, then you can say it's okay. It's a quantum to classical channel, which you can mm -hmm. say it's a pure VM. Um, yes. Or if there is something like this in this situation, it's a bit tricky that it goes for A back to B. In principle, you should write. You can write everything as again as in as channels and uh, um, cons constellation of, of channels. But um, in this case. It also simplifies greatly into this simple expression, where you, uh, it's without loss of generality. You can write it in this form, where simply the so, choice of so, the QBM for B so what, depends on. I B. guess what I didn't get is like okay, intuitively this rule makes sense because this is like uh, like you imagine quantum experiment in which Alice performs some measurement that depends on variable x get some outcome and can kind of influence Bob. So I uh, classically, so she got outcome A of this measurement, measurement MXA. And then like, since, but, but I mean, it's, it's intuitive that you have such rule, but I, I wonder like, what is like, it, is there some, let's say rule that allows you to derive this, uh, this form of response function or uh, like some, or it's sort of guided by intuition and on, on that you build your kind of considerations in this field. Yeah, so there is, how to say, there there were a few, okay, the, the theory of classical causal um, models is, was established like in 90s, so it's very solid. There's no, there are no ambiguities there. Uh, almost, I think. Um, then in quantum case, it started more or less in this 200, uh, 2000, 2010, and so on. And there were different proposals for how to interpret uh, something like a causal structure in the quantum experiment and what we mean by that. And in particular, there is a problem of how to interpret um, the quantum to quantum links and then. Um, yeah, there are different pro different proposals, and in in general, one always, I think a good a good um, interpretation for all this is 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 um, a, a, yeah interpretation as a as a circuit of every co causal structure. You just write um, every node as let's say if the node doesn't have any incoming arrows, it's just a state preparation, and then if you have an arrow. It has to be a, some channel, and then the number of nodes, the number of arrows that leave a node, is the number of Hilbert spaces that you have in that node. Um, and the incoming arrows, yeah, determine just the also the, the the number of Hilbert spaces kind of 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 your quantum channel, if you if you wish. Thanks. <laughs> but in this particular case. It's it's based more or less on, on this paper, where they didn't talk too much about the quantum to quantum uh, links, but they only mostly they spoke about the kind of these common uh, quantum common causes, where it's more or less understandable in the usual kind of quantum experiment, the one that you would expect. There's something like a quantum state, and you just do a measurement on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I stopped here. Um, so how do we interpret the quantum to probabilities? So in this, in the same way, we remove all the previous links to the to uh, node A, and we fixed it to be a particular value. And now the measurement on Bob's side will be uh, just uh, it would be determined by this fixed value A, and it will be formed be, be performed on the marginal state of of raw AB. So we have an identity on A side and this um, uh, effect corresponding to the, um, uh, yeah, P of M corresponding to A, to the value of A on both side, on B side. 
And what is important here is to realize that this due probability is not a marginal probability of, of B. So if we sum over A, we won't get this probability on the right because simply because this outcome of A and A setting for B is the same. So this the rule doesn't hold. Okay, and in the simplest scenario where we have all, all of the observed variables binary, there are inequalities that one can write um, to determine what is the space of observed correlations that you can see, that you can observe. Um, and in particular, in this case with binary outcomes A, B, and binary setting X, um, the space of distributions for classical and quantum common causes, they are the same. So uh, they are described simply by this, uh, this inequality. So just looking at these inequalities, we cannot hope like we do in the Bell scenario, just to violate them and prove that we are, let's say we have a quantum common cause. Yeah, so they are the same. And for that reason, uh, this actually this binary scenario was considered not interesting in the quantum community for some time, because yes, so there's, there's nothing to violate. But then one can ask a question, and that's what we, that's what Raphael did uh, previously. He asked a question, does it mean that also this lower bound derived by Balke and Perl hold? So do we, can we say that this average causal effect that we now measure in the quantum case, um, does it still obey this, this lower bound? And the answer is no. And it was already shown in this paper of 2018, and they showed it's, it's actually not so hard to see because the average causal effect for the binary setting, one can simply rewrite it as an absolute value of the difference of these two probabilities. So I, I can go to the back to the slide back here. You can see that here, if B is binary, then maximization of B just gives you the absolute value. And then uh, the different if there is only uh, if there's if A is also binary, then yeah, it's the same, whether you now subtract uh, probability corresponding to A equal to zero or to one, if you have absolute value, it's all the same. And yeah, so it's this simple expression. And then if you have, for example, a maximally entangled state, uh, then the reduced state on this side of B is, is uh, maximally mixed. And if in particular, you have also projective measurements or measurements for, this, for which traces are the same, then this average causal effect is simply zero. And then you can choose, tune somehow the measurement on the A side, such that the right-hand side is not zero. And then you have violation of this lower bound, but then this was just uh, given as an example in this paper. And what uh, what is the aim of this current work was, is to, state once again and stress on it that even in the scenarios where the observed correlations are the same for quantum and classical um, systems or the common causes in this case, the causal dependencies can be different. So we can, for example, in this particular case, we say that we can overestimate the required causal dependence between variable A and B if we allow for the quantum common cause. And another questions that we wanted to ask in this paper is in this work, uh, what kind of states and measurements lead to violation of this classical bound on the average causal effect? And can we devise a quantum law bound? If we dispute this classical law bound or it's just trivial, okay. And I'll be start. Uh, um, sorry, can answer, I yeah, ask, okay. uh, mm -hmm. Can you just move back to the previous slide? So I just kind of conceptually. Co so so like, I'm a bit confused because those uh, those causal dependencies they are defined in terms of like via those interventions, as far as I understand. Yes. Right. And is it? So, so basically, the way those interventions are carried out is different in classical and quantum uh, kind of regime. So this is, is that how I should kind of think about it? Or so the best the best way to think about it maybe is that 
if you just look at the probabilities observed correlations a b and x a b given mm -hmm. x then you don't see the difference but now if you introduce a new quantity that you can actually measure in experiment and which is an average causal effect then adding that value gives you the, dif the difference between sure sure, sure. but, but it's, it's based on those interventions somehow right or uh, it is based yeah it's based on the inter intervention one can say that it it is because the interventions are calculated in different ways but mainly yeah. i think it is because um, these intervention probabilities they cannot be expressed directly as the observed in terms of the observed correlations you can have something mm -hmm. like flow bounds but you can never have uh, yeah they're not deterministic functions of of this observed correlations so you really just kind of look at the larger space of correlations and that allows you to distinguish okay yeah, quantum and classical case. so why I, i'll tell later maybe it will become clear why i don't think that the really the different comes from difference comes from the different definitions um, of these uh, the probabilities okay so i was here and yeah first what we showed is that every pure entangled state can lead to um, correlations that violate the classical bound on the average causal effect and it's of course necessary it's also necessary to to observe the violation and it's what's plotted here is the violation of this classical bound on average causal effect as a function of of the this degree of entanglement of this partially entangled state and what maybe is interesting is that the maximal violation is observed um, not for the maximum entangled state but for some something that is close to it but not really the maximum entangled state yes uh, the same kind of result holds for the measurement for measurements for every pair of incompatible rank one projective measurements so qubits here we're talking only about qubits it can generate correlations that violate um, the bound classical bound on average causal effect and incompatibility is again necessary to but not sufficient for the violation Okay, um, here is again a plot of the violation. I hope you can see it. And it's uh, given for the angle between the measurement um, uh, of, between the measurements of of op. So here A determines the the sign here of the angle. So it's A is, is phi is kind of the doubling between the between these two measurements. Okay. And maybe as a bit more technical part of this work is the part where we ask if we can get a quantum low bound, a low bound in terms of the observed correlations that would be valid also in quantum case. Um, so here I just give it as a as the bound that we derived, and it's quite okay. It's not very pretty, but what I can show is the region of probabilities of observed probabilities, and I here I denote the regions uh, where these lower bounds are non-trivial. The this blue region, which is also includes the red, of course, is the region in which the classical lower bound gives some uh, non-trivial value, and this red region is where this given quantum lower bound is also non-trivial. Yes, so maybe I could say a few words about the proof, if unless there's some question about particular form of this quantum law bound, or what it means. So essentially, what was important is that one one can of course um, use, uh, for example, the hierarchy of Novaska Spurring and Sassin to determine where there what is the minimal value for the given. Um, Average causal effect. If you know what are the distributions for p, but we wanted to give something like an analytical expression that we would, by which we would show that in in general this low bound is possible. So, not just a simple, not just a 
example of some distributions, but really the region in which this, this lower bound is non-trivial. Okay. So the proof uh, goes as follows. Uh, first of all, what we do, we map the instrumental scenario to the more common Bell scenario. I hope I don't need to introduce that, the Bell one. But here, what is the difference, of course, is that instead of this direct link from A to B, so the, the choices for the measurements on B side, I can now say Bob side, is not determined by this outcome, but it's is given by some independent variable Y. And what we can later do, we can simply take those probabilities for which A is equal to Y. So these correlations on in the instrumental scenario, yes, it's just the bell correlations for which Y is equal to A. And in the same way, we can calculate the two probabilities, which is now a marginal probability for the op side. But what is important is that here, A is this, this two A, is, is the setting for Bob, but we do some over some other A prime for both outcomes of the Alice side. So that's why I think the <clears throat> really the difference between this quantum and classical case is not due to the difference in the definitions, but really we kind of extend the Hilbert, no, sorry, not Hilbert, but we extend the, the space of correlations by adding additional variable, and that allows us to differentiate between classical and quantum case. Yeah, okay, so there's a step, second step of the proof, which is consider a generic Bell expression with generic uh, general coefficients A alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, where now I denoted the observables, binary observables, and, and M. And we can express all, those, all these probabilities that we see um, in the Bell experiment also uh, in terms of the um, probabilities that we observe in the instrumental plus the two probabilities. So by having the two probabilities, we can express all probabilities of the Bell. Uh, yeah. And then by simply choosing the correct uh, coefficients in front of uh, these two probabilities, we can form the average causal effect quantity and with a minus sign here, and then we can put an upper bound on the spell expression. And essentially, by optimizing over alpha and beta, we derived this inequality that I showed earlier. Yeah, so that's it. I, I come to the conclusions. So what we showed Wait. once again. Ah, OK, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry, because it was like, a, I guess, the main result, and you just came move, uh, move back to. so. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait. Okay. What I wonder, like, do you, when you say you optimize uh, Bell expression, so, mm, uh, so I guess you you work in the device independence scenario. You don't assume the dimension. Do you assume the dimension of Hilbert space or, or not? Uh, no. Uh, no, we do not. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because okay, I was like. <laughs> Okay, it was pretty fast. Yeah, sorry, maybe it's it's, it's the yes. <laughs> okay, let's let's if I if you allow, let's <laughs> meditate because sure. it's, it's the, the main thing in your work, right? So, uh, so you start with some generic. Uh, let me understand this. So you start with some generic bell expression, uh, yes. and you kind of choose coefficients in such a way that uh, the those. This average, uh, like causal influence, pops out there inside the Bell expression yes. somehow, and yes. you yeah. uh, right, you sort of up, and then and okay, okay, then you have some free parameters, and you basically treat it as a Bell expression. Uh, it's still okay, it's still a Bell inequality. So uh, within quantum mechanics, there will be some bound uh, on it. And you just employ this bound, translate it into this causal uh, average causal influence, or uh, yes, whatever this thing is called. Okay. Yeah, average causal effect. Yeah. Ah, uh, average causal exactly. effect. Cool. All right. Yes. Thanks. Uh, and it's so it was a bit too fast. Yeah. So for every yeah. So basically for a generic. Uh, Bell expression, you can yeah write something like an analytical upper bound that doesn't depend on any dimension on the dimension. 
and in particular for this case where you have uh, yeah where you chose gamma and delta to be this particular um, yeah parameter salt and bit it's it's quite simple I think looks like that and then you basically plug it in here on the left hand side yeah and then you optimize over then what what you are left with is just to permit yourself in beta. There's some region for alpha and beta that you need to consider, uh, as you can see, because they enter under a square root. So it's a constraint optimization, but it's also, yeah, it's not, it wasn't that difficult to, yeah, to do the optimization and devise a low bound. Uh, yes, okay, then I'll quickly go through the results once again. So we wanted to show that causal reasoning is really different in quantum mechanics from the classical case. And in particular, we can overestimate the, the amount of causal uh, dependence between the observed variables if we allow them to be correlated for the quantum common cause. And we show that the violation of classical bound on the average causal effect can also be used as a witness um, of entanglement and incompatibility. And finally, we showed that uh, even though there are violations of the uh, classical lower bounds, we can still devise some quantum lower bound that is, yeah, that is valid for quantum common causes. And there's some work in progress, which is an experimental realization of this scenario. And we show that one can observe this violation and also um, uh, look how the quantum law bound works. And we also are thinking about extending this result to the scenarios where some of these linked, some of the nodes A and B are not classical, but quantum. So something that uh, Michal asked in the beginning. And we're also thinking whether we can use uh, this violation of classical law bound as a certification of randomness in, in the experiment. Okay, and thank you for your attention. This is the reference and these are collaborators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice uh, talk. Uh, yes, we have time for questions, comments, discussion. Marcus, you wanted to ask something, perhaps. Yeah, I have a very naive question. In this definition of this quantum average common effect, uh, why is there identity on the A part and not kind of the projection onto the eigenspace for the outcome A? Yeah. Um, so there's. Yeah, we also spent some time thinking about the definition. We we borrowed it. We didn't introduce it. We borrowed it from this paper. But uh, yes, really, what we want to do here, we really want to think about erasing the causal link from uh, from the state that can be there on A B to to A, and that essentially already means that we are tracing out this state of A. Since kind of a, just from the talk, I would have expected that one is fixing a particular value of A in the formula. And to me, that would correspond to also fixing kind of having a projection onto the corresponding eigenspace for A. Yeah, this is not kind of entirely I agree, it's not entirely natural, maybe, when you think about it. At first, it's, one wants to really fix the value of the outcome of the measurement, or, yeah, as you say, yeah, fix the projection. Yeah, maybe one another somehow the, um, argument pro this definition is the definition through the um, through them as a marginal margin probability in the Bell scenario. So in that sense, we can have treat them equally for the classical case and for the quantum case. And yeah, then it just follows from the Born rule for the quantum 
uh, for the yeah for the quantum case of the Bell scenario. So you really, if you look it, it, it's at quite if you agree that with I, this mapping, mm -hmm. that my kind of intuition, which is a very weak one, is completely wrong. But uh, it, it just uh, what I would have expected and. I also would expect that something different comes out of it, but uh, whether it makes sense, I, I cannot tell. So in that sense, it was more curiosity, what's really happening in that case. Kind okay, of. yeah, so at least for me, the convincing so argument maybe, was Maybe you this can show the, the, the classical kind of definition again. Sure. Uh, yes. But what if you have this uh, this instrumental scenario? Because you actually do you have the corresponding classical guy in the instrumental scenario in general. Uh, say, yeah, I'm not it's... sure. I'm not sure. So the only difference would be here that this response functions for A also has X. And that's it. That's the difference. Right, but then yeah, you sorry, just I don't, I don't have the right. But then but then what you do in this do, do you then uh, kind of fix the value or do you take like a marginal over all possible values of, of x in this do right uh, yes in the do we really we really really dis disentangled so we throw away uh this part of the alice's um quantum system or ace quantum part we just throw away and then we really fix the the outcome. But it, it's, so it's I meant in the I meant in the classical scenario even. Uh, what uh... in the classical scenario, in the same way we want to erase any dependence between a and lambda. Mm -hmm. So we say that a is now something that we fix by force. So it actually doesn't matter what is. What is here the response function Let's would be? See. Yeah. I see. So so in general it would be depending on this x, and then just somehow yes. throw away completely this part. Uh aha. Uh -huh. Let's see. Yeah, I think in the quantum scenario, you are also removing kind of the post measurement effect of having measured a on the system by tracing it out. And in my yes. attempt kind of, a, it's really just fixing the value, but you still would have kind of the, it's a bit sensitive which words I choose, but uh, the, the effect on the state row a, b, Having measured a, that is what is uh, removed also mm -hmm. in your scenario. And in my kind of idea, I would kind of conceptually only fix the value a, but otherwise not change anything. But, sorry, that, the, that is what is happening. More. So here, if we would if we would consider a post measurement state on Bob's site. Then that would be this double yeah. kind of double dependence, maybe. But we don't no, do no, it. But so that, we really... that the, the question yeah. is when you kind of on the left hand side you have this arrow pointing from the state to the outcome of A. But because quantum mm -hmm. mechanics yes. performing the measurement has also an effect on the state. Yes. So kind of the, that type of effect is removed as well. Which is yes. a so plausible mm -hmm. scenario, but that it's a. Uh, I'm clearly not uh, planning to do anything in that direction, but uh, the curiosity question would be kind of uh, whether my scenario also makes sense, and uh, I would expect a different outcome, but. Uh, 
it's a bit a question kind of uh, whether you still have a good interpretation, maybe in the sense of this 2017 paper you're citing here. Mm -hmm. Not sure whether they have uh, considered this other option as well or not. But, uh... So, so now are you questioning rather the this correlations side or the duplicability? Still, the yeah, duplicability side. side. The duplicability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really, that what, better what to what replace the identity of, by the corresponding projection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we really want to do, we want to we want to forget what was the outcome of A. It's it's really the um, in quantum case we cannot force mm -hmm. and some experiment to give us a particular value, but what is important is that well, no matter what value we get, we need to supply to B some different, not necessarily different, but independent value. So that's an important part. So even if we observe some um, outcome, it shouldn't depend on what will be the our intervention. I don't know if that's, so you can have, maybe you can see that you can have here uh, projection instead of identity, you can have the projection A, but then you sum over that. So A prime, sorry, and then you sum over A prime. Yeah, can, can that interpretation maybe is still like a statistical. Me, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm kind of, I, I'm tempted, but I'm, I'm really, since I'm, I'm not really thinking about uh, those types of correlations on a daily basis, so I said I don't have a proper intuition, but I, I nonetheless have a bit the feeling kind of that part of the, the the differences you see when you do these two probabilities kind of might be attributed to me. It's potentially ignoring too much. Mm -hmm. Okay. That I say, yeah, kind of on the one hand side, I'm fixing the A, but I'm not fixing that I have measured A. Kind of I might so have measured the A fine, yeah. but, but nonetheless, I continue as if I had kind of a measured an A. Yes. Okay. So that would be the same. Right. So you can write, maybe I can use a. No, no, it's Sorry, clear, kind of, if you yeah. make the summation over the A prime, they're yes. just kind of ignoring it. But uh, in this scenario, kind of to, to me, it's a little bit along the way, kind of uh, it, it, I express it kind of ignoring too much, kind of uh, that you mm -hmm. you're ignoring kind of this effect or back action or however you call it uh, in terms of a post measurement state by fixing the A and introducing the A prime. I see. Okay. This is, is it just to, to me on my first impression on the scenario is that uh, it's slightly different, but I I see this two probability for the first time. So I neither have any classical nor quantum kind of uh, heuristics or intuition, what it would be about. So if, if this information about the outcome of A would be also supplied to the part, that would make essentially create a uh, like signaling correlations, right? And we really want the common cost to be of a non-signaling type, whether it's classical or quantum. So maybe that's that's another reason why this this post measurement state is not considered. Yeah, the point. No, I see, I see a point. I see a point that it's it's uh, uh, 
there's somehow we can be, make it even stronger, the quantum case, by allowing these, uh, as you say, back action. But that would only be possible if, if the B part would essentially know the, the outcome as well, or get some information about it. Okay, um, I'm getting quite confused, but like, don't you have, okay, this is a naive question, but like, don't you get some form of back action also in the classical set? Thing. Like, okay, when you have this instrumental scenario with act, like, because uh, you, like, okay, it's not instrumental, but uh, you're also not kind of summing, okay, um, so, I guess what I'm trying to say is that after you observe some particular value of A in this scenario, even though those are like classical states, also formally your state changes, like, post like formally, right? Uh, and it's not present in this scenario yes. when you throw away this response function. So you have analogous phenomenon, it seems to me, although it's much more trivial because you have, so to say, just one measurement setting because it's just classical system. Right. Uh, yes. So, but then, then you still look at the statistical average over all this, all this ex these experiments kind of. I know, I know. I think I know what you mean. Like when you get the outcome of A, you know what was the potential partially, what it was the hidden variable that updates your probability. Yes. And yes. that should have a back connection. But then you. Statistically, sum over the, the all these cases of different outcomes. Yeah, so I'm just saying it seems to me that something a... similar is happening here. That in the quantum, so this this a in the right figure also is independent mm -hmm. on this a prime that you can future. Yes. I'm a bit just confused. Yes. Maybe so. I will say that the questions that Michael's asked me basically mimicked my <laughs> exactly my uh, kind of. Maybe we, we are a bit confused about operation. What those things, I mean, I am a bit confused what those things mean, like operationally, those those do like operations in this setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so maybe I should have said like do zero here, and then that would be less confusing yeah. if I would no, write no, to be like, uh, there's no, a no, zero. I, no, I, I think it's more about the general framework mm -hmm. in which you are working, whether okay. Um, okay, any, okay, we have, because your technical line was pretty brief for our standards, it was very good, so, so, yes, but we moved yeah, to this yeah, discussion, yeah, so let me still continue, because we haven't been past one hour, so are there any other questions to Nikolai, the comments? Um, okay, I, okay, I have maybe one, so uh, do you note what, like, that, whether all such, uh, like would all uh, inequalities that you can sort of derive for the space of correlations, so to say, enhanced by by this intervention, uh, let's say scheme, would they all come from both, from projecting both scenario, or there you expect that maybe some of them would be of different form? So, for this instrumental scenario you can always map it to both. So there's uh -huh. no, it's, it's not, it's not because it's a binary setting. So you, there's I this see. mapping that exists in general. Yeah. yeah, but you can still, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, mm -hmm. okay, you can always play this game that you, you take like a, cause, cause it seems that those, those objects that you care about this PB uh, given do A is some linear function let's say, of your uh, Bell correlations here, right? Yes. So you can always start with some Bell inequality in the space of quantum correlations and you project with some affine linear mapping, right? You, you project it. What, what I'm asking, whether all constraints that quantum mechanics has would be of this form on this restricted mm -hmm. scenario. This is... 
would be of the form of projected Belgian inequalities. Mm -hmm. For the classical case, it is. So all the uh -huh. all the inequalities that you get for yeah for the classical case, you get you can get by projecting the Bell case. Mm -hmm. uh, for quantum, yeah, the, this uh, yeah I guess also it's also the case. There maybe there is some so the, there could be a much more tricky situation in which uh, outcome B. Sorry, no, that's not outcome B. Where what I wanted to say, where this there's if there's an additional constraint on the influence of A on B, if there is if you cannot simply write that the setting of B is determined by A, if you know what I mean. Okay, so for so different scenarios, it might be different. This is what you are saying. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if they are not, that's 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 thank Nikolai again for a very nice talk and nice results that he shared with us. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yes, mm -hmm. and we meet uh, next week at the same time.